since I've started this podcast, I've wanted to have somebody on from the organization called Yoga Behind Bars to talk about the program and the impact that it's had, uh, both with incarcerated folks and people that have uh, that are back home and the communities that they embrace. And so today I finally get that, that, that wish granted, and I have the esteemed pleasure of talking to two representatives from Yoga Behind Bars, uh, Mr. Faraji Bhakti and Ms. Chris List. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the program, uh, what it means to them, how they got involved with the program, um, where they see the program moving towards, uh, but also a lot of the, maybe the hurdles that the program and uh, programs like this might see uh, working with corrections departments or helping to uh, bring um, people that have been released back into the community and integrate them back into the community in some kind of way. Uh, this is a might be a hard conversation for a lot of people to listen to, uh, but there is a lot of beauty and hope in the stories that you are going to hear. Uh, hope you get something out of it. We'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to our show. Uh, today, I am very, very honored to be joined by two beautiful human beings. Um, I've been um, enamored with the idea of Yoga Behind Bars since I learned about it a number of years ago uh, through teacher trainings that I've been a part of and uh, a gentleman's story, which I'll share later. Um, Yoga Behind Bars just, it seems like such a beautiful program to help, um, to help everybody stay in touch with themselves, stay in touch with their humanity, to stay in touch with the community, to stay in touch with the idea that we are energetic beings and we're, we may have made a mistake, but that shouldn't dismiss us from humanity. Um, so today I am uh, beautifully joined by uh, Chris List and Faraji Bhakti, uh, two members of Yoga Behind Bars. And we're going to talk about the program. We're going to talk about what it means to these uh, individuals and um, what they've seen uh, through the program, whether it's an impact on themselves or an impact on the community that it's helping, um, and also where it's going. And so, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm very excited to talk with y'all. Um, I've wanted to find time to be a part of this program for a number of years and uh, have not made the time for myself. So um, the fact that I get to talk to you uh, both is, is very beautiful. And hopefully this will be an impetus for me to continue that desire and to find time to work with people from all different types of community to try to help the betterment of humanity. So, um, so I just want to talk about, like, first off, uh, how y'all got involved with the program and kind of what it means to you. You know, what, what aspects of your life has it impacted, changed, made you look at life differently, things like that. So, um, Faraji, do you want to start off? Or? I would defer to Chris. Chris? I think Chris is uh, diving into Yoga Behind Bars happened before mine. Okay. Chris, love to hear it. So, um, I, I kind of got interested in working with youth when my oldest son was in his late teens and he was actually he might have been well it's been 10 years so okay. he's 31 so he was in his early 20s um, and he got involved in a lot of things that were leading towards um, well jail multiple times and poss I at one point thought possibly he would end up in prison mm -hmm. So, and I saw a lot of his friends getting in trouble and just how getting caught up in the criminal punishment system was not helping anybody to get better or heal or get sober or whatever it was yeah. um, that would have been healing. Um, and also just that a lot of kids were, um, you know, doing things that were relatively normal things that teenagers do or adolescents do and it was being criminalized rather than being helped. Right. So I had a friend, um, Richard Gold, who I did yoga with at the time, and he um, started something called Pongo Teen Publishing, and they go into juvenile facilities and write poetry with kids. Oh, they wow. often just have like one encounter, but they have a method that they use. And so I asked him if I could do their training. And he said, well, we don't have another training for like six months, but you could do yoga behind bars training. Mm. And so I, um, I did it thinking, you know, often when you do something like that, you're like, you don't know where, where it's going to go you. and it doesn't really matter. And it ended up at the end of the training, they, they were like, um, 
here's the possibility of things we have going on. If one of them speaks to you, let us know. And one of them was to go into the IMU, which is uh, it's the whole or solitary confinement okay. um, at Monroe, and uh, do like meditation and mindfulness there. Mm. And I left there and I kept thinking about it. And I was like, I'm just going to see what happens if I put that back to them. And I was thinking the whole time, like, I really wanted to work with kids. But when I ended up getting into this, I realized that I really was working with kids because most of the people I was meeting there were like between the ages of 18 and 25, which wow. we now know. And we know that is still really a juvenile. Yeah. And now that age group is being treated as juveniles, whereas in the past they were being treated as adults. Right. So that's kind of how it started. I started in the IMU and then I branched out to other um, units mm -hmm. at Monroe and did the physical asana practice also, nice. which is how I met Faraji. Yeah. Um, my son did not end up going to prison, but okay. he was, um, he did have some pretty traumatic years. And um, so his healing and my healing have been, you know, we've been on a path. Running in tandem together. Yes. Yeah. And part of that has been, I guess, feeling like I went in on behalf of other people's families and parents and mothers yeah. who couldn't be there for their kids. Right. That's beautiful. For lots of different reasons. Um, well, I think that's where our, our human empathy kind of steps in, you know, where we feel and we see an opportunity for us to do something that... And not, not, no judgment, you know, no judgment for anybody that doesn't have the time, right. the wherewithal, the, the capacity, you know, um, to, to be able to, to do something like that. But when we can find those little spaces that we feel that we can make an impact, um, you know, following that path and just seeing where it leads, you know, sometimes it's just that initial idea, you know, it's like, Hey, here's the idea to be helpful, right? Yeah. Now find, find your way to make that work within the life that you got. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then I just, um, for a long time was kind of, I had the support of yoga behind bars, but I really was kind of on my own okay. because the thing I was doing in the IMU was really different than what other programs that yoga behind bars was doing mm -hmm. because they were mostly the physical yoga practice. Right. Movement practices. And so I was getting to know people in there because I did like a group basically facil facilitated a group experience mm -hmm. where I did writing and we did a long check-in at the beginning. I kind of pulled from different um, resources like 12-step groups, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and I was also going doing some Al-Anon at the time when I got into that, so that was really helpful. And, um, and then I also did a training called The Path of Freedom, which was a similar type of thing. So... Mm. But then I, at that time I was, I was, I was supported like by the psychologist in there and, but I was really like, I felt very like, why is, why am I in here by myself without support? Okay. It, it was always in my mind. Yeah. I had support from yoga behind bars and I had like my mom that I could always talk to right. and a few other mentor type people, but nobody really specifically who really knew what that was like. Mm. And so I always was, I always had the guys in the group to help me. Right. Um, but then as I progressed and um, continued to teach, and then I met Faraji, um, I think in 20, we decided 2018, we met each other. Okay. Um, and he came to class regularly. He was a very disciplined student. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then when he got out, he reached out to me and... Do you want to tell that part? Or? Yeah. Um, I can. I mean, it's a perfect segue. I think uh, for yoga behind bars, uh, it was 2014. And around that time, I was at a facility called Stafford Creek. Um, and I had been incarcerated since 2007 at that time. Didn't know anything about yoga. Um, and then Yana yoga, Bhakti yoga, Karma yoga, Raja yoga, all those other aspects of yoga came into my life, uh, and not the asanas. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I was blessed to embark upon the path of Siddha yoga, Swami Muttananda and, uh, Guru Mai, Swami Vivas, uh, Vivekananda, uh, their, their books 
Swami Vivekananda's books were Raja, Karma, Bhakti Yoga, and mm-hmm. then Siddha Yoga came, and I read The Play of Consciousness by Muthananda, okay. and then got acquainted with their prison program where they were sending lessons, and I was going through some things just as a, a, a father mm-hmm. with a 20-year year sentence and my children being really young. Wow. Um, and so I dove into yana yoga first and really unpack some of my uh mental constructs mm. understanding samskaras and uh then siddha yoga was like simultaneously come in read someone else's lesson it had a ticket on it to uh enroll myself so i enrolled myself and that was really the nectar and the salve to go deeper within myself and find my humanity and why i was worthy wow. of more than my mistakes that I had made, more than the abuse and harm that was doled out upon me. Um, and in that, YBB started, I think they had already started a training for individuals across the whole state, and they moved them all to Stafford Creek. Mm. And then also they had the volunteers coming up for Asana practice. And... um they said yoga behind bars and anything with yoga attached to it. I was like, oh, I'm going to check this out. Yeah. And so went in there, had a volunteer come in and speak to us in a way that really said, hey, I see you. Mm-hmm. You you are seeing, you are honored as a human, not your DOC number, not your crime. Uh, and then the invitational approach, like, hey, you don't have to do any of this. This is an invitation to be in your body, to be in your breath. Felt really um, nurturing mm-hmm. and really compassionate. And so uh, steeping myself in those experiences with those volunteers allowed me to become an advocate for what yoga was doing for me and changing my gang name. And even at the at the criticizing of some of the individuals that I did so much time with... Mm as a different individual. So they saw you kind of growing as a, they see my growing, uh, the individuals that I'm speaking on, they see my growing as like squaring up Mm. or, um, like a threat, faking a, it wasn't really a perceived threat. Maybe it was like, Oh, he's more vulnerable. He's more liable. He's a liability to Mm -hmm. the gang culture or all these cultures and politics that prison, um, seemed to blossom out of the chaos. Okay. And so I kept going to yoga. I went to the graduation of the te- the new teacher trainers um, and was asked, like, why weren't you in this? And we see you all the time. And I didn't really have an answer for them, like, why I wasn't in it besides, hey, we didn't all get the notification, but I'm in it with you all because this is really feeding me And so this is why I'm here. This is why I'm offering up my seva. I had more language through Siddha Yoga and these other yoga texts. Mm -hmm. Um, And I realized, like, I was very analytical and logical and unpacking, doing the swayaya and self-reflection, introspection, doing the chanting. I'm a poet. I'm a rapper. So these things were creating a new vibration in me that I realized, hey, I had to pill out of my brain, out of the yana, go through the raja and the meditation and yeah. the different techniques there to get into my heart, mm. to get into bhakti yoga. And so I moved. I ended up going backwards to move forwards, uh, still trying to provide some financial resources for my children, making some illicit moves inside and experiencing the chafing mm-hmm. of taking off the wardrobe that I were, was presenting myself, my ego was presenting itself and becoming this new person. Yeah. And also all these people that have done eight years with me uh, at this facility, all the moves and all the different things that I made, they could only see the other person. Right. And so getting caught up, going to the whole landing at Monroe, um, as I met Chris in at least eight other volunteers that would come in two times. We even advocated to get three yoga sessions a week. Wow. And um, 
it was the same compassionate culture and invitational care there. I'm diving deep into city yoga. I'm feeling like, hey, do I have Shakti Pot or not? Like it was offered. I'm having all these mystical experiences in my spiritual practice. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm just showing up, you know, really disciplined um, in the space of yoga because I've been held captive away from women, away from community, away from compassionate care. Uh, sometimes the inclination to look out sexually at the women because you're in a place full of guys. So I would bring my folder in, had the picture of my guru right there and said, this is, and Chris and also a couple other volunteers, but Chris more so would come in and say, Hey, if you want to set a silent intention for your practice today, I invite you to do that. Mm. And I always have my composition book with my picture of Guru Mai in front of me. Like, let me give this practice to you. Wow. Let me get out of my head. Let me get out of my loins. I feel this stuff come up. I'm going to look at it. I'm not going to like bury it. <clears throat> right. I had to put the view on it. So yoga behind bars kept coming consistently. Can I just say, interject that something that also I witnessed all of that? Mm-hmm. Like I saw Faraji coming in and I felt like the feeling that I was trying to get at before, which was like he was a person who was doing it with me and I didn't feel I mean it wasn't it was subtle because we didn't we talked but we didn't spend a lot of time talking but Mm -hmm. I just felt like if I had to go to the bathroom he could lead the class or right yeah and also his practice was inspiring to me I mean that's what keeps me going right so I just wanted to yeah a bunch of cosmic mirrors in there um when you're doing you know the sahana like and that's part of your it's not just the asanas Mm -hmm. and so I was able to drop in that. I was able to witness other people get deeper or fall away. Like, and there was no judging of people's journey. It was more like, this is for me. I need this. I really started melting in the Shakti and the Chiti and all the atmospheric things that happen energetically. Mm. Uh, and I noticed that became a magnet for multiple different religious groups. They wanted me to be in their group like, oh, Fraji, come be in seven day. Come take your Shahada. Come do these things because it was emitting from me. They felt and, your energy coming out. Yeah. And I could go into those pockets and spend time. But I really was drawn to the Gnostic and the Buddhist practice that was there. Uh, and just being able to have more time meditating uh, and yoga behind bars stayed there on those consistent days. Sometimes there'd be some wonkiness in the scheduling and I would find myself trying to teach the beginning of the class. People would always say, well, let Faraji do it. And I didn't necessarily present myself as, Hey, I'm, I'm certified. I wasn't certified. Right. Um, also destigmatizing what black yoga look like black male yoga i would be out on the yard Mm -hmm. getting ready to play basketball maybe i didn't get picked up first i would go do my little yoga to have my body more limber and accessible and individuals black individuals would come and say hey man my low backs hey this and um so it started spreading and then COVID came Mm -hmm. and it shut everything down and we didn't feel like community anymore yeah we didn't we didn't realize how important volunteer programs were until we didn't have it anymore and then we really said this feels like they took in our family away wow yeah. because i could see the people from yoga behind bars and the other programs that i was a part of every week mm-hmm. sometimes multiple times a week i wasn't getting visits that frequent right and, and so and we weren't allowed to reach out reach in out. any way we couldn't email we couldn't call nothing so after all these relationships and we were told that created, repeatedly oh my gosh and wow. if we did we wouldn't be allowed to go back and that did happen to some people wow. so it was a big deal like yeah because of course i would have checked in with yeah. people we got letters but well it's like the 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 it, it seems like the humanizing side that y'all brought to incarcerated folks <clears throat> was taken away Mm-hmm. Well, right. I would and say that may have not even been the, the intention when Yoga Behind Bars first started. Mm-hmm. It was, I would sit back and reflect, like, because as YBB started, every volunteer had to go to a DLC training. Okay. And that DLC training is not designed, but 
definitely leads to these people are not humans. It is. Don't trust them. It is. Okay. To a degree. Wow. To a degree. Wow. Right. Well, mine was, but it was 10 years ago. I don't know if it's the same, but I'm pretty sure. And yeah. Right. So all these parameters they put around it, like I want to, I'm trying to be mindful because I've experienced first hand, second hand, multiple hands of the harm of the system. But I'm also trying to bring people in that are in the system. Mm-hmm. Right. So to try to not use all the othering language is still a practice. Chris and I go back and forth with like, hey, how do we want to address this? Because we want people to come over and be co-conspirators and allies. Okay. And so somebody wrote the policy for training. OK. Chris was told other people were told, don't shake their hands, don't trust them, don't do any of this. However, the power in yoga and moving your body and breath I would snicker back because I kind of knew oh, what the training would be like for individuals to come in and then what's happening in these yogic spaces. Wow. And I would snicker and say, they thought that we wouldn't be seen as humans. Right. Right. Like, so then I got out. So, well, right before I got out, I wrote Yoga Behind Bars, like thinking who's going to be able to speak or write a letter for my freedom. Yeah, my family's there. They're going to say all the right things. Mm-hmm. Even if we don't have enough visits, they're going to say the right things. Who has really witnessed my evolution? Yeah. Who's seen me the most consistently in these last few years? So I wrote to Yoga Behind Bars. Somehow, my initial message got to Chris and Vanessa, another longtime sponsor. Yeah. But then I got a letter back from the admin team at YBB like, we can't do this. We can't write this letter for you. Mm. And Chris and Vanessa must have not got that message. They wrote the letter and got it to the powers that be. And fast forward, those letters weren't even brought up at my resentencing because a whole new law came out. Okay. Uh, I used my yoga practice at that resentencing. Got out on Guru Mai's birthday. Oh, wow. Full <laughs> moon. It was, well, the day before Guru Mai's birthday, wow. June 23rd, 2021. Okay. I'm released. June 2024, Guru Mai's birthday. It's a full moon. I'm feeling all the auspiciousness. It's the hottest it's ever oh been God. in it was Tacoma. That heat wave in the- it's oh, 112 yeah, yeah. degrees. Oh, People are complaining. I have not a gripe. <laughs> I have not one gripe. And then I'm trying to figure out this tech divide, this digital divide. Mm, yeah. And I get into my email account chris is there vanessa i reach out send a picture like i'm free Mm. and because the implementation of training chris wrote back and said hey i'm not supposed to and i said hey if they ever ask me i don't know you right and chris said f them and same thing with vanessa same thing with the buddhist sponsor same thing with the gnostic sponsor like they see me as a human and I was able to advocate briefly about myself. Like, you know how much connection happened in these spaces, how much healing happened for me and to see you maybe one day at the grocery store at the fair. And I say, Hey, I'm free. And you turn away and like, do you know how much that would, so speaking that to Chris, not possible anyway, for me, I would never do something like that. Right. And some people are really scared. Chris. Yes. And I have felt that fear for sure. Right. We don't want to ruin the program. Right. Yeah. Most definitely. And so, wow. Chris met me on my son's birthday. Uh, and started advocating with YBB to get me to speak more, to speak up uh, about how harmful it would be if there isn't some type of communication. And we moved forward in that. I became a board member. Mm. Uh, we should say, too, that at this time, Yoga Behind Bars was going through a lot of turmoil. Okay. Because our former leaders and people who've been there for quite a long time since the beginning, a okay. lot of them were leaving to do other things. And there was just a lot of upheaval. Um, and COVID was decimating program. Okay. It, we were shut down for yeah. three years. We had some youth programming, but we were, are we going to survive? And I was at that time evaluating whether I wanted to stay because I felt harm. Yeah. Not from the individuals, but just the way we had to be. Well, it seems like, I mean, just from what you both were explaining about the program, 
for me, yoga is what connected me to humanity. It, yeah. it connected me back to myself. Like I was so far removed from myself. I had no idea. Right. And I'm part of fucking humanity. I'm not, I'm not incarcerated. I'm free for all intents and purposes. Right. Yoga found, like helped me find me, felt yeah. me find the me that I, that was proud of. <clears throat> so to teach yoga in a place where it's coming from a non-humanistic side is, it, it seems like it'd be something completely different, right? It's something that, because, you know, body consciousness, mind consciousness, we're, we're, we're spirit beings and that's what yoga teaches us. Yeah. You have the, 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 the peaceful, the, the slow practices that you spoke of, like bhakti, then you have the asana practices, the movement practices, but it all revolves around you being a human being and feeling the energy and the power of you as a human being. Um, so to, 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 to hear, and it's so interesting too, cause it's like it, from what you guys are saying from like, this is the training that was given down, but you know, from, from you, Chris and Vanessa, you spoke of, it seemed like it's like, well, okay, parameters, but that doesn't work. Right. That's not how we are humans. Right. And the other thing I want to comment on too, for Aji is like, I could only, I couldn't, I couldn't even only, I could not imagine the strength it would take to walk that path being surrounded by that that egocentric side of what incarcerated folks would step towards, that ego side, right? Because you got to survive. Right? You got to survive. And so to see somebody take what would other maybe considered a softer approach to look at the self and to sit with the self and to be peaceful and to find, you know, find the reason, find the meaning, find the why. And, and to be, you know, looked at by your peers is like, oh, shit, look at, look at Faraji just sitting there. You know, whatever context they were, they were putting that, that I could not imagine the, the strength that it would take to continue that path <clears throat> and through it, that and to be where you're at now. I mean, it was all part of a, a plan that was bigger than myself. Mm. I did dive in and a, a, a few things that you said, like really reverberated. It was actually, it didn't reflection out easier. It was easier. Mm. Um because there was some ego death on my be part that I took upon myself doing speaking fast. Hmm. So I, wow. I, I, I'm, I'm, I can speak all day. <laughs> I can speak all day. He's teaching my three month old grandbaby how to speak. Mm. <laughs> just beatbox. <laughs> just beatbox. Yeah, uh, he doesn't beatbox. understand the words. The words are in consequence. Uh, he might. He might. Uh, yeah. So taking on that approach in that place um i didn't know i i was just trusting i was trusting guru mai mm. and the practice and what was ebbing through it and in 2017 uh right around my birthday i said i'm gonna go nine days without speaking okay i'm gonna do this novena a nine day spiritual practice prior to that I love the number nine. So on the 9th, the 18th, and the 27th, I would do 12 hours no speaking on the 9th, 18 hours on the 18th, and the whole day on the 27th. Wow. So there, it was conditioning, but I really didn't have like some mapped out. I was just being a student of the present moment. Love that. And so I mastered it inside the cell. Then I said, I have to be around people. So I went out into the day room mm. and had my card that I would flip over. It says speaking fast. And there's a lot of communication that goes on without verbally expressing. Okay. And then time started expanding during these moments of not verbally expressing. Dang, and then you're making me want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of stuff got done. So yeah. much got done yeah. without talking. Yeah. And so then I mastered that. And then I said, I got to go play basketball. I had to play basketball on one of my days. I'm a vocal coach. Yeah. I'm a, so I had, and it made me even play basketball Ugh. at a tougher degree. Okay. Um, because I couldn't call fouls and I couldn't say, hey, cut and do all the stuff. And so. More intuitive, I guess. Right. Yeah. And then, so then September came and I was just diving into my practice and I was like, okay. From the 21st to the 30th, my birthday is on the 30th. This is nine days. I'll go nine days. Mm. No speaking. I'm going to dive in it. I talked to Mutananda because at that time, he already transcended in 82, but he was like the pulse of Siddha Yoga. He was really beating, beating, beating down my door. And I said, hey, I'm going to get October's lesson at the end of September. If you put in here the word birthday 
and the lessons are like 15, 20 years old. Mm. But the first page is the monthly newsletter. Okay. And I said, if you put birthday somewhere in this packet, I'm going to know that you're here with me on this path and that I have to have the same devotion for Guru Mai. I didn't have no, like, there wasn't, there was just some resistance. It wasn't, oh, she's a woman. It wasn't, oh, blah, blah. it was just like Mutananda was just, his, his Shakti was so palpable. Yeah. And so I dove into this practice and what happened for me, like, in the egocentric prison survival world, after three days, the ego kind of shut up. Mm. It was like, okay, you're not going to do anything. You're not going to, like, feed me. So I'm just going to be quiet. Okay. And then I started seeing the light in everybody. There was an actual visual light that I could see. Wow. And it was the self. And as you said, mm. like, this, uh, you said study yourself, all the self words, the lessons from Siddha Yoga on the top says in search of the self, capital S self. Yeah. So I started seeing it in everybody. Mm. And as my fast was wrapping up, I started seeing what everybody covered it up with. Oh, wow. And then I was like, oh, man, what am I supposed to do, Guru uh, Mutananda? Like, what am I <laughs> supposed to do? I see it, but I see all this other stuff. And he said, love them anyways. And I had some friends that were supposed to be friends, but they were judging me. Then I had some people that were just associates. And when I finally spoke, they were so joyful to hear my voice. Wow. And my friends were like... What'd you do that for, man? It's been like a month. You haven't talked. And, then, and one guy was like, hey, can you write me what you heard from God? Oh, wow. But I broke the fast by chanting in Sanskrit. I'm not fluid, but I have my chanting book. I chanted, 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 chanted on my mat. And then I opened up the Siddha Yoga lesson. And I'm reading that front monthly newsletter. Uh -huh. And I still have it at my home right now. And in that first paragraph... It said, Baba Mutananda said to Guru Mai on her birthday. Oh, shit. And I was like, no, not as it in the packet that's 10, 15, 12 years old. Yeah. It's in this present. And I just cried and I surrendered again. And I went out and started loving people anyways, mm. no matter what they would see in me. When I got to Moreau, me and my friend Jacob, we were on the yard. He worked on the yard. He was like, it's just God picking up God, putting God in God because he was picking oh, up trash. Man. And I said, let's stop. And look at everybody on this yard and say, I love you. Mm. And by the time we finished that, we were vibrating at such a frequency. And shortly after that, I'm in a yoga class. Mm. And I, so it, it, was a, it was a lifestyle choice. Right. The yoga behind bars provided a certain container to let me see my humanity reflected back in the, the individuals that was coming up. Mm. To let me dive deeper into my asanas. Coming home... It really was Chris advocating to the powers that be at Yoga Behind Bars amongst the upheaval, amongst the, her own, I was pulling her back, like, don't quit now. Like, something's around the corner. Don't quit. I'm out now. Like, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. And then new leadership and old people that have been there a while leaving and all these things and COVID stifling everything. And then we got a contract to do 18 workshops for juveniles. Okay. Chris probably did 15 of those. I was so dove in. And they were paying me. And they were paying me well. Yeah. What, more than I've ever made in my life. Hustling or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I did all 18. Nice. I made wow. myself available. And through showing up and embodying how much like, yeah, I did this time. That made it really relatable. I could rhyme. I could be hip. That made it really relatable. Right, yep. And then I'm up here doing yoga. And we got a contract with DCYF. That allowed us to get some movement going. And then slowly the, the institution started opening back up. But the whole time, we were able to have each other and have the reflection. Chris used to thank me a lot about, like, I always needed somebody to kind of check in mm -hmm. that had felt the visceralness of the harm of the system. I needed somebody to check in with. And as we did those check-ins at the speed of trust, at the pace of peace, I was able to say, hey, let's not find fault in YBB's prior 
leaders that didn't know that volunteers needed to have a debrief, that best practices was to have two people in the space at all times. Like we are pioneering that. Right. I don't even think I used the word pioneering, but we were. And it was like, this is this is the lesson. We're going to make some mistakes until we build best practices. And then we started coming with community agreements. What do we want to call individuals that come home? What is, we don't want no reentry. Hmm. That's what the system was calling it. Uh, system impacted, formerly incarcerated. Those are terms that weren't agreed upon or had the people that are being deemed these things at the table when defining it okay and so liberated individuals for people that come home uh are are incarcerated community members incarcerated individuals is what the system is trying to say now they Uh, they 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 use the word offenders which is an offensive word exactly yeah it's a label right i mean i never use that word yeah and, and re-entry. What do you want to re-enter? I don't want to re-enter into anything that I was in prior mm, to. Right. Yeah. yeah. Restorative justice. Well, I don't even know how far we would have to take me back to say, oh, my humanity was restored. This is the time I was not harmed or hurt because I am a foster care to pr- the prison pipeline uh, individual. Okay. Uh, and so we started framing these words and these languages and they kept considering my experience um there's other people that have released and reintegrated whether who who's to determine what success is Mm -hmm. but we know that if you don't have community if you don't have a place where you can be absorbed for your humanity when you're reintegrating the other r word comes up recidivism Mm, okay Family reunification, reconciliation, reintegration, these are things that the system has in their policies. And that's what's really doing the harm. We like to say they, it's a lone individual or a group of individuals, but it's the handwritten policies that are written from a viewpoint that's steeped in white body supremacy, Eurocentric, punitive, all these things that don't honor like what it looks like for me to come back to my children that were six, seven, and eight when I left and are 20, 21, and 22 when I come home. Right. Wow. It's interesting because listening to you talk, I mean, I've heard your story, but of course I'm hearing new things too, which is really touching. But also just like I grew up in a family that loved me unconditionally and supported me and continues to my parents are getting older but I felt like I feel like that having that as my background I I just naturally when I started going in I was like of course I saw people as humans like it wasn't a question to me right and so for me the system it took me a while to really understand because I I, I had a very, you know, my own viewpoint of the world is not really realistic. Right. In fact, my therapist once said to me, you just weren't prepared very well for the reality of the world because you had that gotcha. Gotcha. kind of an upbringing yeah. that was like, people are valued for being human, you right. know, and you are a valuable person too, and you can screw up and you can, you know, I didn't, I didn't have to go to jail because I got caught drinking in the parking lot or whatever, right. you know, so... Yeah. So for me, that bit of naive naivete was helpful, but it also I needed more context. I needed, right. and so I think for me it was like, why am I not integrated with? Why is this not an integrated community? Right. Yeah. And because that's how it should be. So yeah. that's where we started to move was and into you, that model of yeah. Well, and when you see something too that that is so. It, it's so blaringly different than what you have been led to believe, right? Yes. Um, you know, for myself, kind of very similar to your story, Chris, I grew up with very loving parents, loving brothers, loving community, lower middle class kind of stuff. Mom was very heavily involved in the YMCA, um, so we saw all aspects of life, you know, mm-hmm. from people that could afford to pay for all their families to people that had to be on scholarships, you know, everybody, right? And so we grew up in this area that it was very, my mom did a great job welcoming everybody in our, yeah. in our area, right? Um, but I grew up in the South, 
in the 80s and 90s. Very racially charged, very ignorant, you know, homophobia, racism, all that shit, right? I got flyered by the Klan, like, constantly by our, our mailbox. We'd go out, like, five years old to check the mail, and there's, like, ten flyers for the Klan. What the fuck is this? Mm-hmm. But again, luckily my parents were like, hey, okay, so there's ignorance in the world. This is, mm-hmm. you know, we're able to explain it to us. But I also grew up around people of multiple different nationalities, colors, races, all this stuff. And and I was, at the time, heavily involved in drugs, alcohol, things like that. Young, young kid, nefarious shit. And I saw constantly myself and my white friends be let go from cars that were pulled over with multiple races. And I had shit on me when I got let go. They didn't find it. But I, like, in, in certain situations, I would be the one that had the thing. Yeah. And I would be... Hey, get the fuck out of here, white kid. And then my Hispanic and black friends would get searched yeah. and more or less molested, right? And so growing up under that, like seeing that face to face, like I didn't know what to do with it then. I didn't know. I thought I was lucky. I didn't know the levels of racism that were there and, and all that shit until, <clears throat> until really I got up here. And it was, it, I don't want to say it's a funny story, but it was like, it was such a, an eye opening experience. I moved up here from Texas. I got pulled over. I had like an ounce of weed and a bong and some shit on me, right? Enough to put me in jail for a long time in Texas. Like my brother went to jail for 30 days for half a blunt. So I was like, I was expecting to be in jail for like six months. I'm like, okay, here we go. We're Mm going to do this, right? They searched my car, did all the stuff, found all the weed, found all the paraphernalia. Thought I was a grower. They sent some, it was like an hour, couple hour uh, ordeal. And then they came back and I'm just sitting there cuffed up the whole time on the side of the road, right? Just sitting there like, okay, what am I going to tell my parents? I got to fucking figure this shit out. I'm in school, blah, 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 all this stuff running through your head. They come back, take the cuffs off, hand me a ticket and say, be in court in two weeks. I'm like, be in court in two weeks for what you just found on me? I get to go home? What the fuck is this? Mm -hmm. Like, don't get me wrong. I was excited and happy. Of course. But at the same time, I'm like, well, how is up here so different than down there? Yeah. And then I start putting things together. Oh, it's a lot more racially charged down there, right? It's a lot more like there, there's a lot more money to be made from the penal system down in the South, right? Because it's more entrenched in that, right? Not saying Washington's any better, right? But it was just it, at the, those young ages, seeing mm-hmm. that, seeing and, and witnessing that. And I saw that with my son and his friends. Okay. That's, I mean, he, he's 31 now. So like I was seeing what was happening to mm. his friends who were not white. Right. And then he had a lot of friends who were fairly affluent white families, and it was a big contrast. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with legal representation and right. yeah. support of parents and that sort of thing. Yeah. So. Well, Faraji, I want to draw back real quick to, to your, your silent experience. And, um, and you know, I, I just want to really make sure the listeners know how hard that is to do. And I know you said after day three, you kind of settled into it. Um, so I've done a 10 day, I've done a multiple 10 day meditations, uh, silent meditations, but in controlled experiences, everybody's silent. Everybody's there for that reason. Everybody has set, you know, dinner, meditation, walk, sleep, meditation, dinner, like it's all set up Yeah. To, to do it on your own in involved in the penal system is I, I couldn't even imagine like it, having done that, having experienced that again in a controlled way. For you to have that experience in in a population that's not also experiencing that, or maybe even embracing or encouraging that, I have so much. It's not even respect. It's like admiration for the path that that the the strength that that path takes. Because um, I know the I know the outcome of it, and I know how beneficial stuff like that is, and how hard it is. When I was going into the hole, I was always like, I didn't want to be like can you make this into a spiritual retreat? I didn't want to be like that, but I also kind of was like that. Like yeah. you're here. So how can you like make the best of it, you mm-hmm. know, and how can it benefit you? But without the idealism or whatever, but when I met Faraji, like, and a few others, I could see like, that's what he was doing. Right. So it was like, ah, so this is possible. Like he has his book, he's got his mat. He's like clearly on a path, mm-hmm. you know, and it was inspiring. Yeah. yeah. So do you guys see, so with the movement that Yoga Behind Bars has seen since COVID and the, the movement you've talked about in the personnel, um, do you see it coming back in a different way, maybe in a more embracing way, in a more humanistic way? Or do you think it's something that might be something that, like something created that's new, 
right? That that might even be under the guise of yoga behind bars, or might be something completely separate based off of the experiences that y'all have had. Yeah, uh, definitely. We've been dreaming and um, cultivating, reimagining. Um, I feel like I'm tapped a lot to like put different ways of thinking, like through my experience. Um, I'm really valued for my experience and there's a bunch of gratitude for that because those experiences, like you were speaking of the speaking fast and, um, in a place where you're, you're, you have all these authority telling you what to do Mm -hmm. and like, but I was training them. They were being trained on the days that I wasn't speaking. Like I didn't know where I was going. So that's the same thing with YBB. Um, coming out and I wrote a bio or something that said I went from a yogi behind bars to a yogi beyond bars. Mm. And so now we are breathing a lot of life without even funding, without people dropping coins in our coffers for yoga beyond bars. Um, I did push back on uh, Gabby uh, and Zoe, our current co-executive directors, when I heard the word abolitionism brought up like YBB was yoga behind bars was an abolitionist org and I was like I don't feel like that's true Mm. and I don't quite recall where that conversation went but I recall and can recall where we're going now and how like deals with the system contracts with the system how we put that into our dream and beyond bars and how you know, I lift up, Chris brought it up. Like, what is our commitment at one of our retreats? Like, what is our commitment? How long are we going to be here? And then a bubble in my brain said, it's not even about the time. It's about what do we want? What do I want to see happening with yoga behind bars where I could step away? Hmm. Because this is in my lot in life. This is not what I want to do. I don't want job security and nonprofit, which only to me means somebody's going to need some service. Right. So I'm like, how do we train individuals inside? We do have some teachers beyond bars, behind bars. But how do we get enough people trained inside where we don't necessarily have to come in and do a program every right. week? We could come in and do a, a, hey, we're coming in. We don't need your check, DOC or DCYF. We just want to come in and do a weekend intensive. Wow. And build community while they're still like, they don't need the classroom. They can do it at the gym. They can do it at the yard. They can do it in their units. They can do it at their sales. And just to say that we we haven't had a contract with DOC ever, ever. Um, but we have been in the process of trying to get a contract signed for the last year. So that's new. Yeah. And it's not ideal, but... We need the money. But yeah. we need the money. Yeah. Yeah. We need the money to be able to honor the humanity of the folks going in, the mileage. Like, there's no prison right off of a bus stop. Right. Right? And even when we're doing yoga in these places, uh, I want your listeners to hear that it's not your your yoga studio. Right. With the sprays and the, the humidifiers and the good chimes and the... no. It's a place that was used for something else, and they made some space. Right. And it's a little like going to an AA meeting. You're in a basement, and it's ugly, but you're sitting in the chair. It's like that. Yeah, yeah. You're in the chapel, which is not a chapel. It's a square room with no windows and maybe a thin carpet on the floor, and you're packing it. Maybe there's a guitar in the corner or something. Right. Or you're in the visiting room, and you're moving the tables out of the way or whatever. Right. My, uh, my fiance, um, is a yoga teacher also, and she does more trauma informed yoga. And, uh, she just actually stopped working for, but was doing yoga for Fairfax hospitals. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so there was uh, three Fairfax hospitals in the Seattle area and she would go between those. And there was a number of yoga teachers that would do this. Can't remember the name of the program. Um, but they just lost their funding too. And they Mm. just, they just were removed from, that's uh, too bad. Yeah. That is so beneficial. A a lot of what y'all are saying uh, you know, echoes a lot of what yeah. Monica would tell me about, you know, the experiences she would have in, uh, in, in, the, in the Fairfax institutes and how, you know, people would come up through all the time. Cause she's, I mean, yo, she's your tradition, like your classic open, warm, loving yoga teacher, right? She's just wants to talk to people, wants to touch people, wants to see where you're at, wants to help you. And it was a wall every time. Don't talk to them. Don't touch them. If they mm-hmm. come up to you, you got to turn around, you know, shit like that. It's like, well, where's the humanity? How are we supposed to help people if I can't talk to people and touch people? These systems are you know? 
completely interlinked. The healthcare system, right? The prisons. I mean, it's all the same shit. Yeah, and so that's in moderate, what, moderate. You know, with right their policies, right? Their, their stuff that says this is a wall and hasn't been reinvestigated. So and someone's making some money. Someone's making a exactly. lot of money, yep. and somebody's getting disserviced out of that money grab. Right. Like it goes back to a poem that I wrote, Capitalistic Cannibalism. Mm. Like they just eat us up, eat us up, tie us to these things. Um, I definitely wanted to put some more words around yoga beyond bars. Yes. Just uh, principles of transformative justice, uh, relationship, respect, responsibility, repair, reintegration. Uh, yoga beyond bars works to ease the transition from incarceration to life in greater community. Like, that it's it's challenging. I've said it, swallowed my words, said it again, swallow those words that it was easier in prison. Wow. And I've had some of my systemic siblings utter that mm. recently. This could be a good time too to talk about the BPC. Yes, please. Because the community for me, just as like a outsider, I guess, coming in. As, so there was like a wave of people who were released during the pandemic. Okay. Also, Faraji can speak on that a bit because there was legislation that led to that. And so the Black Prisoners Caucus, the BPC, which had started in the 70s at Monroe here in Washington State, was a pretty powerful inside organization. And a lot of guys got out who were part of that. And so we, I'll let Faraji speak on it, but we, for me, what it feels like is all of a sudden there's like a community of people outside who I can meet and talk to and go to events with and not only that be friends with yeah and it's not all BPC but it's all of these interrelated people who gather so it feels really different because that was not happening like five ten years ago yeah so, so what was the impetus for the black prisoners caucus not being honored as humans okay. not having hygiene uh access to education um, even as they banded together in solidarity, they split a lot of those individuals up and that was just really just pollinating. They just spread seeds ah, because now we started popping up with more chapters. You <laughs> sent one person and intuitively we were investing in leadership and advocacy and synergy and using the quantum principles, collective work and responsibility, mm -hmm. uh, cooperative economics like hey you don't have we have we're gonna all chip in um and so yeah they they ended up spreading seeds we'll definitely get to the bpc i just want to also just finish this yoga beyond bars arises from our many years working inside prisons jails and other carceral settings and through first-hand observation of the unending cycles of harm and violence perpetrated by the punitive legal system. This program grows out of experiencing and witnessing the lack of true rehabilitation offered by these institutions and many of the obstacles to reconciliation created and maintained by the system. It grows out of our belief that the solutions to these problems are to be found with the guidance of those most affected by these systems of harm and by working alongside those with lived experience. We, our team wrote this. Like wow. we right. wrote, this, this, is, isn't our, this some, is our This philosophy. is our philosophy. That's beautiful. And, and it's <laughs> the investing in Faraji and Faraji being community-based. And, and like we have BPC members that teach hmm. for YBB. We have on other- On board too. Uh, on our board. All right. We have other individuals that have, their, that are liberated individuals that teach for us, that go inside of, carceral settings and experience that emotional trauma. Wow. Right. And we pay them well. Mm. We, we make sure that their mileage is comp. We have community classes that are specifically for the geared toward the liberated individual to come. Hey, we got a gas car for you. You don't have a yoga mat. We have a whole yoga bundle for you. And we're going to bring in other people that want to see you thrive. Mm. They may not know how, but they want to. Yeah. And like we have many people banging down the door. We want to volunteer. We want to volunteer. I've been fortunate to be in the space when we have volunteers that say, oh, yeah, I taught at this place. And I, I just love it so much. And then my first thing is, why do you love it? Why are you so excited? Right. 
right? What, what, Some people don't have the truthful answer. Right. I don't want to say the right or wrong answer. The capital T truth. Mm. Why are you so excited to go inside a prison and teach yoga? Right. And that kind of like goes back to like why the work we're doing, like, you know, there's definitely like, I mean, uh, me included, there's mm -hmm. definitely like a kind of a, a atmosphere of white saviorism, right. I would say, whether or not we intended it. To, I don't think anybody intended for it to be that way. But I mean, that, that's, that was kind of the ethos, really. I think we've, we all have evolved beyond that, like, to a degree. I mean, mm -hmm. but I think that was, you know, kind of baked in it, in into there. it's baked into nonprofit culture it's baked 100%. in it's you know yeah. right and, the, the aware, and we're consciously looking at that and saying i think that's the difference is yeah being aware of that blanket being put over having exactly. that awareness and, totally, and yeah. that's all i like my personal model going in teaching even though i'm the community engagement specialist i go and teach and i'm like all I really could hope for for these individuals that I'm stewarding yoga to is that they be more self-aware. Mm. Because yeah. even being on the board or being an employee, and they say, well, traditionally, I say, who's tradition? Mm. Yeah. There you go. Who was the first nonprofit? Like, right. and, and then when I was backing out of the board, they're like, no, we need you, your voices. And it's like, this isn't doing it for me. One, you guys all have jobs that are paying you a lot of money. I don't. I'm working as a security guard, mm. coming to hear all this blah, blah, blah about numbers and <laughs> metrics and all this stuff and none of that. It's not connected to the work we're doing. Really. So I mean, it is in some way, but. But somatically not. and where I was at in my reintegration and, and so as I spoke up and said, I'm going to go ask for a job. Like, I believe there's more people championing for me than actually come and tell me. Mm. And so I'm getting ready to move into co-executive director. We're going to be moving Yoga Behind Bars to all black uh, leadership. All right. Chris is still going to be there. Our other co-ED is still going to be there. And this goes into the Black Prisoner Caucus community group. There is a plethora. There's a abundant amount of us home. Okay. And that amount is minuscule to the how many people that aren't home. Yeah. Okay. And we all been released for whatever reasons many of us not making it to our erd earliest release date okay which mine was december 19th 2024 okay. so i wouldn't be here with you right wow. now and i was 27 on my last trip to prison so maybe i'm past the threshold of what maturity was mm. i still had a lot of growing many of those people that have reintegrated in our liberated individuals now were children. Yeah. And what I'm witnessing, what I'm speaking to for my black prisoner caucus community group members, for my members that are still inside the sisters and the brothers is wellness and even being able to sit still enough when reintegrating and be supported enough by all these organizations and foundations and jobs that say, here's a check, here's $72,000 a year. Here's all that. Because we come out looking like full-blown adults. There's so much that we missed. Right. Yeah. And now, as it's been two and a half years for me, it's been two years and a couple months for Miriam, who's one of our, our liberated individuals deeply entrenched in YBB, Alyssa Knight. Uh, we got... Throwing all this money and all this responsibility, and it feels good mm. because you were inside, merely feeling like a number. Right. Our incarceration is not the qualification for these occupations. Mm. Our wellness has to come first. Our like money being set aside for people that come home and say, "Here, if you want to spend seven thousand dollars on clothes and shoes, you get that right." We have individuals that were 14 years old when they went in and came home at 34 and they get thrown all these adult things when you're already adultized as a youth, right? adultized in prison, get out. Now you're an adult body, but there are some things you want to experience. Yeah. Some yeah. wild things, some things that somebody that sees you as an adult maybe gave you a job says, oh no, they're a liability. Mm. They don't honor the humanity, but they see us being brilliant. They right. see how we speak up, see how we're coming together, but we're not really talking about 
the harm. We don't even know the harm. We yeah. didn't know how sinister the the oppression that we were experiencing inside because there is something, especially in black bodies, that if it's not physical harm, mm. then you're not like you better muster up. Wow. So I come home. I've been having one bowl, one cup, one spoon for 14 years straight. Okay. Wow. I go into the kitchen, sinks full of dishes. Mm-hmm. I've been like challenging my family, like, hey, all you have to do is use one plate, one spoon, wash it right then and there. There will never be a dish in the sink. <laughs> but then there's all these options. Yeah. And then I look. And I'm like, all this stuff. Then I got to do all this prep. We're cooking out our microwave okay. for so long. Or you go to the chow hall and you just stand in line. And you don't have to do the prep and the sous chef and all the seasoning. You just grab this tray. You sit down. You eat it. You dump it. And you leave. Mm-hmm. If that was my most stable and consistent life. And then I get out. Mm-hmm. And I get all these other options. It's overwhelming. I'll just leave. I can imagine. I, and I'll I see. Eat. I have a lot of women friends who were incarcerated for long periods of time now and i just see like a lot of people got out like two two and a half three years ago and i'm just kind of witnessing like there's kind of a wall that people are hitting right now yeah, yeah. like it's like two burnout years out and burnout. just like kind of exploding into what else can i do yeah, yeah. maybe it's not going to be the best for me but i got to try it you know right. just it's starting to feel like prison that time it's starting yeah. to feel like oh i'm i'm so and then and then the, the information, like you don't get the reps, you don't get the reps in yeah. some of this new adult stuff. Right. You have never done it. Yeah. You were a kid when you left, adult when you, you came home. You might have home. just got your first cell phone, which was like a Nokia flip phone, and then you right. go right. in and then you come out and you've got like the world. Never had a right credit here. card. Never right. paid taxes. Yeah. Yeah. Never like figured out what interest rate should be for what. Yeah. Saying yes to everything. Yeah. And so we're pioneers on this bpc is doing the work for there's an arc mm. i love playing with words and and they sometimes say it in a different order but this helps me remember it arc so we got advocacy okay. we have how do we advocate and amplify the voice of the incarcerated um we do that in multiple ways i specifically personally do it through the underground microphone where i have poets and short t- story writers call in i might go to a local venue that does open mic plug it plug my mail to mail in and liberate their voice wow uh we have the r which is uh, let me think reintegration support resource support reconciliation support and repair support okay. so like people are coming home that may have robbed somebody murdered somebody Maybe been away from their kids, family reunification support. Yeah. Uh, we're, we we don't know how to attack that f- on hand, but we're bringing in partnership. So those are the R's that we do, however it looks like, because folks are coming home not necessarily having verbiage to what they need. And then we're like, well, we want to be there. And then we got saviors that say, oh, yeah, here you, here you mm-hmm. go, got a job, this and this. And that's not what humans need. Right. We, we, there hasn't even been, maybe there is, but I'm going to just say it from my, I believe there hasn't even been anybody to study what long-term reintegration, because recidivism was the big thing that everybody was, oh, the return back, why, why, and you're not even, and so now we've been out, a lot of us, over two years, Mm -hmm. hitting these walls, are we being able to speak to it and be held in it? We have some people that got there and committed crime again. Some people get out and get killed yeah. because they didn't do the reconciliation work that inside. was needed. Right. They may have did the work inside, which is taking every fate. If I kill somebody and then their family and gang members come in, I got to fight everybody that comes in. Wow. And then you do all your time and come home and the wound in the community Still that the there. system never has. And so, or you might get a re mm-hmm. and they shave off a year, two years, 10 years causes that wound again yeah and now you're not even and, you're safer in prison and the system wow. not only does it not address those things it actually also makes it harder for people because 
maybe they can't talk to the victim's family or maybe right. they can't. There's no, no that's possibility not a maybe. of that. Yeah, that's a definite. Exactly. It's in your sentence. It's a law. And it's not even like an lifetime, option. Wow. Like, lifetime. Like that should be an option at the very least to have that yeah. kind of help. Well, just think, I mean, the, the reciprocity on both sides of that, you know, from the person that may have committed the crime to the person that was the recipient or like a family member of, you know, there's all these questions and concerns and things like that happen. It's like as hard as that resolution path can be, I think it's so important to find the resolutions. And even if the person like say, say I was the aggressor on somebody and I got to a point where I realized that and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very you know apologetic for what I did and I understand where it came from. I don't expect you to, to accept that apology, right? That's up to you, right? That's your journey, right? But for one person to get to the point to where they can release the energy around the <clears throat> whatever situation it was on their end, what they were a part of, mm-hmm. there's a beauty in that. And so creating the container to where that can be had is such a, an important thing. And somebody should be given BPC and YVB $500,000 <laughs> because the system, as you say what you just said, mm-hmm. there's a wall you're going to meet. Even as Chris said what she said, like it shouldn't even, it should be first. There should be trauma-informed practices mm-hmm. in the system in the court system that says hey we're about to send this person but that didn't solve anything right and then the victim more percentage of the time is from the community right so That's the pain the just goes right back into the That's community the and then this person gets out and may feel may act out of fear may even had that come to moment that I need to ask for forgiveness because I am not this person no more, but you are seen and everywhere you go from the probation to your job application to how you got to show up. If you go back inside the system, they want you to write all the crimes that you ever did to even get through the background check. They don't want you to associate with other felons when you get out. What if all your freaking family are, I mean, like right. it's absurd. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense, you oh know? So it can't, the reconciliation never gets addressed. And now we're doing this work, unpaid, emotional labor, right? And the C, the C in the arc of BPC CG is community and court support. Okay, we go in, and 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 I'm gonna tell you, Adam. We don't have enough time to unwind all the stuff, but it's weathering in me and others as they grow on this journey. If BPC is definitely abolitionist, we have so many cloaks that we're wearing. Okay. Yeah. So I go to court to support somebody being released. Okay. I'm an abolitionist, so I'm going to come up here and speak. And then we have Manny Ellis that gets killed. And BPC is being not knocked on our door. Come support the family. Mm. So first, with the, the the hat of abolitionism. See, I see you you tracking where I'm yeah. going just by the, the our listeners won't see the visual, right? How do we go to court to support the family as BPC mm-hmm. when we're abolitionists? We want the prison, the police, to go to jail for this. And then the next part of it is, does that reconcile anything? Right. Like, yeah. the first thing is, oh, just give us, throw some money out. Yeah. So we, I can't go to court and advocate for anybody going to prison as an abolitionist. Okay. Now, as a part of my humanity, I may go and say, hey, I'm not wearing my BPC chain. I'm not here. I'm not Faraji Bhakti BPC. I'm Faraji Tacoma Pierce County community member okay. and I feel there's some injustice here and I don't think prison is going to reconcile anything but I am here to be in support of this family just to say I'm here whatever you choosing to decide you're the closest to this reconciliation and all this yeah. that's your choice and I have the right to stand in solidarity or say hey I supported you up until I can't we're not having that conversation. And I, and I think the work of abolitionism really is to build around. We can't flatten we it can't and knock flat it out. down. We can't. Right, yeah. We can't. But we can build around it so that it starts to change things. That's and also we have to focus on. We can't focus on the negative of the system all the time because right. it's harmful. So we have to like focus on the joy and the community and the life giving nature of the work we do rather than 
how awful it is because yeah. otherwise, well, I mean, it's we'll uh, burn out. You're you're fighting a, a, a giant entrenched system that goes back farther than we can even imagine. You know, and now we've got economics wrapped into it, and we, racism's always been wrapped into it. I mean, sexism, so, and sexism. You know, there's ableism, and it's mm-hmm. it's. I mean, it's. Oh my gosh, I couldn't even imagine like how daunting it feels. But at the same time, like just seeing the impact on a person. You know, a family, a community, you know, is that thing that drives the the desire to continue on and to find the way to make this work and to find the people that can help and, uh, you know, the the, the projects to work towards. Um, That's, I mean, it seems, it seems overwhelming. And I I know a a minuscule amount about it. Um, So does that, does that, does that feeling deter um, either of you from, kind of moving forward or is that like the fuel to say like, Hey, we need to figure this out. Like we've got some people, we've got some ideas. We need the momentum. I think we just feed off of each other. Like he and I and Gabby and Zoe, and that's our core group. And we have a halftime, uh, operations person now, Ashley. But I think we, and then our community around us, we support each other during all of that Mm. time, whether it's the joy or the, despair. And I, as a person who has not been incarcerated and really I've been harmed by the system, but not nearly in the same way. So I don't always want to take that to people who I know have been harmed because I don't feel like they need to hear every bit of my, but at the same time, I think there's a place for it too. So it's like, it's just a constantly like navigating and saying when you need support, like taking care of your, such a cliche now, but like what, what does self-care look like? And I think Faraji's really been exploring that. I mean, yeah. I have too. Last year was my first full-time year and I ended the year, I feel like I ended the year just kind of sliding into home, like <laughs> yeah. kind of battered, yeah. even though it was a really good year and we did good work. And I think we both felt really good about it. It's like, we both kind of just went, even our relationship, like we stopped talking about work cause we were just like getting burned out. And yeah, totally. So we both took time off. Faraji's taken next week off. Like, hard to get away. Yeah. Because I teach regularly inside, too. And so, like, trying to figure out the, some balance with that. And Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, I think we got to find the balance, you know, because we can, we can only give so much before we got to replenish. Right? Yes. Um, but, you know, Faraji, I wanted to speak to something you said earlier about, um, about trauma and how, you know, we can, you know, and, and this entered my field of understanding when I started my journey in healing, uh, but it was put to me in a way that uh, outside of the prison system, you know, and it was the idea that like, you know, when you start, when you start your healing journey, you, you're healing not only yourself, but you're healing seven generations past and seven generations forward, right? And it's that idea that like, say my grandparents said that grew up in the, in the depression, right? They had no idea that they were experiencing trauma. So like, we're experiencing not only the trauma that we have that we've integrated in ourselves, but we're experiencing all the trauma that's going on before us. Right. But then you add the layer of incarceration, right. And you're, you're now experiencing trauma that you just normalize, right. You normalize the aggression. to normalcy. Yeah. yeah. I wrote you know? a piece on that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that's just, and that's so hard to finally get to the point to where you realize that that much trauma has entered into your field of being to where you can find a way to release itself from that. Um, what, what inspired you to write, write about this? Just your experience. Uh, foster care. We were doing a foster care convening. Um, I was with the concerned lifers organization inside of WSR Moreau, uh, Art Longworth, another person that maybe you reach out to and do a podcast. He's free. Got okay. a whole bunch of time. Very great writer. Okay. Um, he had got Treehouse organization to bring in a bunch of people. Then he went to the hole. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what are we going to present? He had a whole thing about the beast. And so I wrote this piece called uh, Desensitized to Normalcy because I didn't realize as a child in the upbringing through my addicted parents and in foster care and then moving in with a family member or how our adverse childhood experiences were expressing themselves and even my rebellion to abuse or, or, uh, care came from being desensitized to what normal was. Right. 
and like even maybe a pull to go back into some dysfunction because this is what I was my formative years were steeped in. Right. And so the the separating the two really came from just self study and like, oh, what are some of my proclivities? What are some of my tendencies? What are some of these behaviors that I hold and hide and don't want to bring into the light? Right. If I'm choosing three principles, truth, life, and love. And every time that some of my dysfunction come up or some of this trauma comes up and I want to hide it, then it's not truth. It's not life. It's not love. And so, and it's still like today, like there's still a war going on because shame adds a few more S words to it. Like you feel shame, you suffer in silence. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. And you don't want to share it. You don't feel like you're going to be honored. You give this stuff up and then you get judged and ridiculed and shame or remorse and regret have a couple things that interchange, but more so the remorse side, you could say, yeah, I did this. This was coming out and I've worked on it. I set it aside. But the judging and the regret is like, oh, it comes back up and you regret your decision and you judge yourself all over again, yep. which goes into the tunnel of shame. Yep. And now I don't share it all because I don't want to wear it all. Right. And like another one of my my models is, you know, you have to reveal to heal. Mm-hmm. And if I can't reveal, like people really like get eyes watery, glazed over here in my poetry, how I show up in the world. And that's fine. But if I reveal some of my dysfunctional behaviors, or if I reveal some of my trauma, am I going to see the same type of admiration and love reflected right. back for the total totality of my humanness? And I pull up this carpet, show you a little mess, and I see, and it may, you may be looking at me. I may have an internalized narrative or projection that you're judging me, and I cover it back up, right. and I never deal with it. And so I can't get to no healing because it's never healed. I don't believe so. I don't believe there's an ED. I'm experiencing trauma right now. Right. Totally. So I think the revealing to heal and and it has to be in space because we're all cosmic mirrors. And having safe cosmic mirrors around you that can hold and reflectively listen to you and say, okay, yeah, that's causing something in me. But let me speak back to him what I heard him say mm. first before I respond or give them any advice because I have an issue with feeling paternalized or, or any type of authority. You get to giving me too much advice that I didn't ask for, nor have you reflectively listened to me where I'm like, Oh man, you do hear me. Now I'm going to be more prone to hear any advice. Right. That stubbornness kind of sticks in. Right. Yep. So, wow. Wow. That's very, that's a lot. You know, there's so many layers of what you're speaking to, you know, the human conditioning, not only within the prison system, but outside of the prison system, you know, and I think that, you know, again, like finding the strength to be, um, you know, in this, in, in that mindset, in a world that doesn't embrace that mindset for incarcerated folks. We don't, but we barely, we're barely at a point where we embrace that mindset for people that are homed, right. That are free, right. right? To, to, to feel comfortable crying in public. Like I, I, you know work with clients all the time about emotions and things like that. And, you know, there's, you know, there's been a big rise, I'd say in, in, in masculine representing, uh, humans being able to experience their emotions. Right. And, and thankfully right, mm-hmm. we're, we're able to finally cry, talk about it. But at the same time, there's still a lot of shade that's thrown at that. Right. Let's take like Michael Jordan a number of years ago, um, came out in a, in a public interview and was crying about, I think it was about his dad passing away a number of years ago, the, the murder that happened. And was, you know, openly crying, you know, red eyes, tears streaming. And it was, I watched that interview and I felt beautiful about that. Growing up watching Michael Jordan and seeing him be such a badass and and personify the athlete, right? Mm -hmm. To see that athlete break down, it was beautiful. But the next day, memes all across the internet about Mm -hmm. talking about how much of a bitch Michael Jordan was Mm -hmm. or crying little baby or all these things. It's like, dude, let the man have his emotions, right? Let, Let us be emotive human beings we're here to experience the emotional spectrum of humanity and Let's most of that comes it, from right? other men you know yeah it really yeah. does and i can't say that i wasn't that person before right mm-hmm. i wasn't that like oh toughen up or you're okay don't cry i'm mm-hmm. a little baby you know but at the same time like where i'm at now 
in my life, like I can still hear those voices because, yeah. you know, it's there, but it's just a voice, right? It's mm-hmm. a voice within the other voices that says, hey, I'll look at that little crybaby over there. You should go over and give him a hug and mm-hmm. tell him how awesome he is because he's able to express himself in this way. Right? <laughs> so it's, you know, we, we getting to that point to where we yeah. can embrace the human Being experience. able to witness your conditioning yeah. and then mm-hmm. work with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with, uh, with where you're at now, uh, with the changing of Yoga Behind Bars, with the Black Prisoners Caucus, where do you see this taking y'all over the next bit of time? Like re-implementation of getting programs back into the, the systems themselves? Um, I love the idea of, you know, the, the homed uh, Black Prisoners Caucus members being able to help reintegrate and, you know, get people back into the communities. Is that what a focus is kind of moving towards for this next maybe year for you guys or? So we, we are back inside okay. um, and our programs inside are much less than they were before the pandemic because we're moving slowly. Mm, okay. We're trying to get to know our and support our volunteers perhaps a little bit more mm-hmm. better. We had a time at YBB where we had an explosion of new teachers and there wasn't necessarily the greatest like mentoring program mm. set up. So we're not doing that. We're learning from the past, um, and so we're, we're on that path, but as far as Yoga Beyond Bars, I mean, I think we're, we're really integrated with a lot of organizations, like mm-hmm. the Freedom Project and Collective Justice, Justice and choose one there's a lot of overlap cool. in how we work, and yeah, so that's a f- community work, not just with BPC, but like more integrated into our community. Yeah. We're not, we, you know, there was sort of, I think the pandemic brought us to the realization, like we're not all fighting for the same resource. We should be fighting together for that, for our communities. Right. And there's enough to go around if we all go get it together. Yeah. Um, well, is it as it's, just, I'm going to make a quick statement real quick for Aju. So sorry to cut you off, but like it just, it baffles my mind to think that there's not money for this as corporatized as prisons are now and as much money as like just what they're saying that they make, right? Because there's probably all the kinds of nefarious shit going on behind the scenes. The amount of money that's being drawn by the prison system, right, rightfully or wrongfully accused, is staggering to think that we can't reinvest in our humanity to say, you've made a mistake, you're here, let's Teach it's a trade. Let's learn something. Down. Right? It's upside down. It's, like it should be at the money. The resources should be at the beginning right. before. And it's like, like why wouldn't youth you want is to... a huge. Youth is a huge. That's a huge investment for us to yeah. focus on youth community groups. I mean, we're really we we're small, mm-hmm. but we're we're definitely and we at YBB just to quick word we stopped our youth programming before mm-hmm. the pandemic. Okay couple of years before because we were finding that it wasn't helpful and part of that was that kids were being forced to go to yoga and right. you know that doesn't really nope. work and so ybb wisely just said we're putting a pause on it we're going to do a bunch of different looking around and learning about how we can do better with that and um i wasn't involved with youth programming at the time but i think we started on a totally different path with it yeah and so that is definitely a priority for us i think working with youth I got one story I want to share real quick, and uh, and I think Chris, I talked to you about this in our pre-interview that we that we had a while back. But um, so when I uh, for a number of years I was doing teacher yoga teacher training, so I was part of a teacher training group, and we you know hold the trainings and stuff like that. And uh, <clears throat> I think it was like the fourth or fifth one I was a part of, and I met this gentleman named Chris. And um, when I was you know we're going around the room, introduce so what what brought you here? Why are you passionate about yoga? Got around to Chris, and uh, Chris was like, I've uh, I've never taken yoga in my life, I've never been to a class, uh, but I've heard a lot about what it can do for people. And I'm like, cool. All right. So why are you here? You know, that passionate about never doing a practice in your life. You're like, I'm going to fucking learn this thing. <laughs> well, he was going to jail. He was going to prison. I can't remember how long he was going for, but it was a good amount of time. And, uh, and he wanted to go in with a skill that was helpful. He wanted to go in and be a part of something that could help people. So he decided to, to spend his money to do yoga teacher training. He got the training, having never taken a class before in his life, so he could have a skill to go into prison with. 
And when he was in prison, he practiced yoga all the time. And I think it was in Vegas. So I'm not sure if they had a yoga behind bars program there. But he's, from my understanding of talking with him, he started a program where you know people would do yoga with him, whether it was like an organized thing or he would just set up in a room and people would just say, hey, I'm going to do this. If anybody wants to do it, you can do it with me. So he you know, did his time, got out, and is still teaching yoga in, in communities. And learning a skill to go into prison blew me away, right? Because you want to be a positive impact on people in, in that position. Like, fucking amazing. Good for you. But why not teach and give an opportunity if you want it, right? To, to, to learn a skill, a trade, a, a, a thing that you can bring back to your community when you come back, Right? Yes, I've done my wrong. I've sat my time. I've done this, but I've also learned something about myself. And I have this skill, this yoga that we know is beautiful and whatever practice you choose to, to, to approach, whether it's movement or, or sitting, it's there. Yeah. You know, it just, it just, I don't like to follow conspiracy theories, but when you hear about shit, sometimes it's like, how are we just that far removed from it? Mm -hmm. And it's really not. If there is a plan. And yes, that sucks, that's right? that's one thing that has been hard for me to accept is that the system isn't broken. It is working how it's designed to work. Exactly. So yeah. that and that is a conspiracy. It's it's real. Yeah. It's a real cons like racism is a conspiracy. Exactly. Yeah. So you don't even have to get wild with conspiracies. <laughs> right, exactly. Just, yeah, they're right there. Yeah, they're there. Good lord. Yeah. So Faraji, <laughs> so as you know, you continue on with your, your position with the, you know, uh, yoga behind bars, black prisoners, caucus, you know, where yoga beyond bars, which I'm so amazed. I'm just so happy to hear that. That's a program that's being worked towards, if not already implemented, uh, you know, where is your energy kind of moving towards in these next few months, next like year or so? Yeah. Well, co-executive director and then being able to be supported in, in, in some of my, outlook on where we need to go yesterday's team meeting really put some things into perspective for me about not necessarily expanding but diving deeper uh like the expansion without having deep roots can set us up for failure uh i really look forward to yoga behind bars being the cohesive agent with all these other orgs and community activists grassroots activists to collectively like chris was saying go build this coalition bring in the funds that we're not fighting each other for this funds but then we can kind of scale down what we do because we want to do reintegration and reconciliation all these things bpc is doing that freedom project collective just all these things but really really what yoga beyond bars even yoga behind bars would would be my aspiration is to we be the people that they come to for wellness mm -hmm. and we center wellness because we're, we're for asking the specific them type of wellness that we provide, which is trauma, somatic, informed, somatics, trauma -informed. like, and having this, like, Hey, we're <clears throat> going to come back. We're going to come multiple times to choose one eighties office because they're dealing with people with high needs that have been systemically oppressed and mm -hmm. harmed, uh, uh, community passageways. Some of these local colleges that do uh, prison program, prison, uh, post education, all that stuff. We want, I would love for us to like hone in to make sure they're stewards of whatever they're offering to individuals that have systemic oppression. Mm -hmm. Treehouse with the foster care kids that I work with, that they come and say, We want yoga beyond bars. We want to do their somatics training. We want to do their trauma-informed training. We want them to come in twice a month. We're going to pay them to come in twice a month yeah. to bring sound bowls in this therapy and that we become that that agent of wellness because we got a whole bunch of work to do. We got a whole bunch of people knocking on our doors, asking us for pro do certain programs, but we're not all the way well. I'm not fully yeah. well. Chris isn't fully well. Yeah. Um, and if we don't have all that stuff, I want to be a magnet. I want to raise our vibration and emit an energy that where it's just all about wellness. It's all about wellness. And, and they're we coming have to our, get our us. Yeah. Co-executive directors are, I would say, somewhat revolutionary in that way with yes. Yoga Behind Bars. I mean, I today I was communicating with Gabby and she asked me about a morning practice I'm doing. And then she told me about a morning practice. She, and I was just thinking, 
about our meeting yesterday and you know she is her care for us is pretty amazing um and zoe too it's just like it's really like sometimes i'm like well we need to work and they're like no you need to take a step back and i'm like no i need to work you know there's like this tension but it's like my drive to work is always going to be there but my ability to balance that is more dubious so yes, yes i think it's i'm really grateful for them like their leadership has actually caused me to want to be still here and to and now zoe is going to step back and faraji will be co-director with gabby and so it's exciting mm. i i feel you know i'm 58 okay. and i'm like i've had other career you might say in healthcare. um so i feel like I couldn't really, I couldn't ask for more than that to be in a place where I have the opportunity to do important work and also to have people who care about me. I feel very young and energetic, but mm. the fact is like I'm in a body. Yeah. So I have to honor that and yeah. my mental health and everything, you Most know, definitely. like I can say I'm invincible, but we all know that's bullshit. So, yep. And I have to, you know, the drive to, for work, I show up. That was my model last year. Like 90% of my job is just showing up. Yeah. And like, I need to have that drive for my wellness and inside we call it a program. Like I want to highlight for the listeners again, that that for we're in Washington state, that 14 years that I did in prison was my most consistent life, my most stable life. Yeah. There was a lot of things in there that cultivated some stillness. And we call it a program. Like, oh, you get up, you read your book, you do this, you go, you go to the gym, you got to work for four hours. You got, And out here, you have way more options. Yeah, duh. But people don't realize how that impacts you. If your most stable life was a place where you only had to make five decisions a day for 14 years straight. Yep. And then so then the struggle for me becomes my enoughness and performative mm -hmm. when I'm making more money legally than I ever made illegally. Mm -hmm. I feel like I got to go. I got to respond to this email. I got to show up to the meeting. I got to do this. I got to, even if I'm doing it by the seat of my pants, I got to show up. Oh, well you should take this training or oh, you should sit down and go through the whole Google workspace. Like this, the, it's information overload. Yeah. Especially from the years, like I want to also just kind of highlight just because a person went to prison, I said our incarceration is not the qualification for our occupation. Also, it's different and we cannot replicate these systems that cookie cutter yeah. everything. So this person may only did right. a year, a year and a day yeah. went to prison. This person did two years. It's hitting different. These are unique situations was traumatic for you adam may not be traumatic for me right. and that, and maybe somebody will do a study and be like oh yeah the threshold's about six and a half to eight years and once you get past that so many things because those are reps right i've been home two and a half years inside of 14 years of repping how to be a human in a dehumanizing place right so now I'm out here and it's like, oh, this is new. Oh, I'm going to break. This is new. Oh, you should be on a retreat. You should be relaxing. And it's like, this shit's new. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't have the neurological pathway in there that's deep enough to say, yes, choose this most healthiest decision when you get $4,000. Right. And I think, and I think echoing that, like, at, for me, it's like I've worked in healthcare for 13 years. It's all, a, it's just a capitalist model of yeah. like how many patients can you see in a day and we were always fighting it we were always struggling but like that's how you survive so it's constant pr productivity right and it's not healthy no and it doesn't match with what we're doing yeah and so. that's something i've you know as i moved into this new life that i'm living now that's something i've had to keep very front of mind because i grew up in corporate world yeah you know, where it's like kpis and what's better exactly. than next year better than last year better than yesterday all right this grow shit. grow grow right and it's yeah. like to what point like, I worked for a restaurant that was 30 years old, and they still wanted 20% growth year after year. I'm like, that is fucking impossible. It's insane. And Capitalism. Right. And it's like, so, you know, you get to these points where you get that decision fatigue. It's like, it's so much that you just cower in the corner and don't make any decisions because there's so many to make. And I feel like we all have that over us, but we sometimes we don't even know it. It's yeah. like a, 
it's a way of living that we just were born into. And we're like, at some point you're just like, Oh, yeah. I don't have to be like the best at this. I can just do it and enjoy it or whatever it is. Right. Like, yep. And how does the work with YBB we're, we're doing this good work. How do we stay in this pocket? We're so, we're such a small org right now. Yeah. So we're all carrying multiple titles really. And how do we like, Focus on going deeper in our connections and our authentic relationships. Chris brought up capitalism. Uh, uh, I'll invite, ask for an invitation to share this piece as Please. we're getting close to wrapping up. Yeah, this because is this is this is it. This is capitalistic cannibalism. Oh, this is what you've written. Beautiful. Servitude changes the mood of the optimist into pessimism. Victims of capitalistic cannibalism. The avarice capitalist soul seems so vacuous, as if they're missing their frontal lobe, incapable of empathizing with the needs of 81% of the globe. The wealthiest 19% has taken a hold of every morsel and particle of gold and natural minerals, supplying rule-defying generals and cynical tyrants who insist on trashing the oceans and thrashing the earth while infringing upon the women's decision whether to give or not give birth. No child left behind the public fool system programming design adolescent to the adolescent mind. Then the antidepressants leave them inclined. Slave labor through incarceration Take the 42 cents that you're making, divide by two for legal obligations, and a third of the remaining goes to crime victim compensation. What's the math in this equation? 20% of the world's wealthiest uses 80% of the world's resources, while the other 80 are forced to scramble for the remaining, which explains inflation. Let's reimagine empowering the people to get back to community-centered synergy, reviving the all-inclusive prequel. Before it was etched in these words, sketching of mystical birds contain what couldn't be explained. So let's reimagine empowering the people again. Wow. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for writing that. that I mean, I get emotional just hearing it. You know, that's, I mean, that explains and, and talks about so much of you know, what we have to work on. Thank you for writing that, man. Thank you. It's yeah. beautiful. Wow. Um, so where can people go to support Yoga Behind, Yoga Beyond, Black Prisoners Caucus? Where can people go to learn more about it? You know, is there uh, separate websites? Is it all kind of linked together? We'll put links in all the well, show Well, Yoga Behind Bars listeners. has a website that's separate. And okay. our names and faces are on there. If you want to reach out to us, you can cl literally click on our picture and email us. Um, and there's a Which donation. Which is what I did. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I got a hold of Chris. <laughs> and there's a donation button on there also. Um, and and Black Prisoner Street. Caucus, you can, uh, Black Prisoners Caucus, I believe it's cg.org. Um, we do have a website. It's We're still working nuts and bolts. Uh, but you definitely can go to Black Prisoners Caucus CG on Instagram. Okay. And, and YBB. And YBB on Instagram. Instagram direct, and Facebook. Direct message uh, them. Um, there's links. There's uh, QR codes on both to donate. Um, and yeah. we post. Uh, I do most of our social media. That's one of my other jobs. <laughs> um, and I try to post just stories about what we're doing as much as possible with the time I have. But So there's like reels and stuff showing mm. the work we're doing. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, and show up to a community. We would love for, for anyone people to, to come, come to a community class and share that with us. Yeah, get to know us that way. Wow, once a month right now. So okay. once a month, always posted on social media. Usually the first Saturdays, but if you follow us, check us out on social media. It's pretty active page. You'll find out what we're. And up that's to. free. You you don't, you can donate if you want. If you're moved to do so, if you can, but it's please just come. Yeah, right. Create the community. Yeah, keep keep fostering it. Well, thank you both for so much, so much for the work that you're doing, uh, the work that you're still doing and working towards and things that we don't even know that y'all are going to be a part of in the future. Like this is big, big work and it's hard and it's, it's arduous and treacherous and beautiful. So thank you for, for dedicating your lives and the, the time that you have for this. I appreciate y'all. Thank you for your time. Yeah. We'll thank see y'all soon. Yeah. We'll get you back soon. Can't wait to talk again. Thank you so much for spending time with Chris Faraji and myself. 
Um, please check out the show notes for ways that you can support Yoga Behind Bars, Yoga Beyond Bars, the Black Prisoners Caucus, any of the programs that we've spoken to or spoken of. Uh, also ways you can support uh, the show. Obeisance and love. We'll see you next time.